Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. What a great week. This is actually an interesting week. First of all, I want to talk about, about my sister. My sister, as you know, is in film. Uh, and she said, you know, she likes the videos. Okay, but where are the film credits? Where are the film credits? Because my apparently if you're in film, you stay through the end to watch the film credits. Well, so because of that one request, Janet, you will get film credits today if you stay to the end. Uh, today we're going to really focus on vaccines and where we stand in terms of getting to that 60 to 70 percent that we need. But first, a little bit about how we're doing across the world, Texas and, and in the United States in general. So, you know, the world is <laughs> the world's a mess. The U.S. is doing better than everybody else. Europe hanging in there, but the rest of the world is kind of a mess. Uh, but it looks like things are beginning to at least uh, peak. India continues, as you see, I'm sure, on the news. They are just really struggling to keep up with the number of cases. Uh, and so they are bad. But the hot spot in the world right now is Argentina. Argentina has more cases than anybody per capita. So Argentina is really booming in the world of virus. And the state of the virus in the USA is what, is what I had said before. We're kind of in this lazy, slow, slowly dropping towards getting better. Uh, I don't think we're going to have a, a, a fourth phase. Though that's good. We're probably not going to have a fourth peak like many parts of the rest of the world. But we're just not getting to where we want to be as fast as we want to be. And really, you know, we're going to be lucky if we're in, in you know, good shape by the time school is open. So, you know, that's the real issue. Things are getting better in Michigan and Minnesota and Illinois. They're all dropping you know, case numbers. Uh, what's a little bit of concern and what I want to talk about is the pace of vaccination seems to be slowing. In Texas, we're like the rest of the country. We're just trickling down in numbers. We've got about, uh, you know, we have little hot spots in, in Texas. I, I always say, I don't know what Dimmitt County is, but I'm never going there. It's every, every week. They're, they're leading in, in number of cases per, per capita over the last seven days. In the Texas Medical Center, our, our number is finally getting to below one. It's still not where we want it to be. It's still, you know, it's this race between getting enough people vaccinated and the emergence of variants. The wastewater data shows very clearly that the, 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 use, the United Kingdom variant B.1.1.7 is the main variant in our community, and that's part of the reason why more and more people get infected, despite the fact that we have, um, we have vaccinations available. And our p test positivity rate and our, our new cases, again, are, are pretty much the same. New cases have gotten down to about five to 600, which is better than 1,000, <laughs> but they need to be 50. So we got a long way, we long, long way to go. If you look at the weekly average, it's pretty clear that it's plateaued. And the, the other thing is, as our one physician always reminds me, hospitalizations, hospitalizations have been plateaued and not really falling very much. But they're, you know, they're about 104 each time, each week for the last several weeks. So let's talk about the state of vaccination in the country, because that's really the only way for us as Americans to get out of this is to vaccinate because we don't follow directions very well as a people. So uh, there's good news on that. We have 34% of the population that is fully vaccinated. Fully vaccinated, you got either two shots of Moderna and Pfizer and you're two weeks beyond that, or one shot of J&J &J and you're one, uh, two weeks beyond that. Uh, so, but remember, there are 340 million people in the United States. And for us to get to that 70% where in Israel, the numbers dropped really dramatically, that's 238 million people have to be resistant, either because they got vaccinated or got, or got the, um, the vaccine. So 114 million is a long way from 238 million. And that's, that's the, the real problem. But here's, you know, and, and what we want to do is get to that 70% number. And if you look at the projections based on our current vaccine rate, you know, we might get there by the end of August, just in time for school opening. And that's sort of my hope, is let's get there by the end of August. The bad news, however, is this is the rate of vaccinations. Remember, we were talking about how great we were. We got up to 4 million. Well, now it's been dropping off. And that's being seen everywhere. It's beginning to drop off pretty dramatically. States are even turning down their allocations of vaccine. Wisconsin and Illinois requested only 8 or 9% of their allocation. You know, 
What's with that? And they're in, they're in parts of the country that need vaccinations more than anybody. Iowa's like 29% of their allocation. There's, there are some states like New York, Maryland, Colorado are still getting all of their vaccines and using them. So what's the hope? Well, we hope kids will do something. The adults often, you know, I don't want to get vaccinated, but I'll, maybe I'll send my kid to get vaccinated. But that would help. There's a lot of kids in the country that could really contribute. Remember, about 20% of the U.S. population uh, are children under the age of 18, and that's 72 million people. And if we could get to 70% of, of, of those people vaccinated, of those kids vaccinated, that's another 50 million. So that would get us pretty, you know, half to a third of the way of our goal. So what's the good news with kids? Well, the Pfizer study, the Pfizer results are the kids over 12 uh, can now be vaccinated. That just came out this week. Uh, that was from a study of 2,260 uh, enrolled children between 12 and 15, 18 cases of, uh, of uh, COVID in the placebo and zero in the vaccination, vaccinated group. Their side effects were very similar to everybody else's, uh, and that's been now approved. So that's very exciting. Now, Pfizer starting, uh, started their 5 to 11-year-old study in March, and this month they're doing a study from 2 to 5-year-olds. And I think that we'll be applying in September probably for the two, over two-year-old uh, group, assuming everything goes, what, uh, goes well. Moderna trial had 3,235 participants, and they were received, uh, randomized to receive vaccine or placebo. There were 12 cases of COVID-19 in the placebo group uh, and none in the, uh, the, the vaccinated group. And so they probably will get approval for over the age of 12 also fairly soon, hopefully this week, uh, by the end of this month, we, we should see that. Uh, and we think that they will go uh, to the same kind of full licensure in, the, in, in September. So where we stand now is the, you know, Pfizer is approved for over the age of 12. Those are two shots, same dose as adults. Moderna will be approved, we think, same thing, over 12, two shots. Uh, and Johnson & Johnson right now is 18 and older with one shot. Now, Baylor, once again, we're in the mix uh, and we are very much involved in those trials uh, going forward. In the Pfizer phase one, two, three trial, which is six months to 11 year olds, they are doing the dosing study, which is phase one, should be done this month. One of our, our very own Dr. Munoz is the primary investigator for that study. And the idea is to enroll 4,500 patients in phases two, three. Uh, and the design of that study is there'll be two kids vaccinated for everyone that receives placebo. And at the end of six months, the, they'll do a crossover. So even the ones that receive placebo will then get vaccinated. And we think that the completion of that will be uh, in July, hopefully approved by the fall. So that will be six months to 11 year, year old kids. The same study in Moderna trial is led by Dr. Nicholson, again, Baylor faculty, and Dr. Munoz is the co-PI. They're doing the phase one dosing study this month, and we hope to start phase two, three in uh, July, hopefully maybe even in June. So that's very exciting. It looks like we can begin you know, to, to uh, participate and help move these vaccines along. Uh, in the Texas Medical Center, we have now almost a million people fully vaccinated and 1.8 million who've at least uh, received one dose. But just like the rest of the country, this is our doses a vaccine. You can see we peaked and they're beginning to drop. And so there is really this, this vaccine hesitancy that is a problem. Some of it's access to vaccine, but a lot of it is still people out there going like, I don't want to get a vaccine. So when will we reach 70% in greater Houston? So let's forget the rest of the country. Let's just think about ourselves only. When can we start behaving like life is back to normal? You know, I think when we get to 70% of Houstonians either vaccinated or having had COVID, we'll be there. So that's like there's 7 million people in the greater Houston area. 70% is 4.9 million people. We have to get either vaccinated or have had the infection. We just, uh, Dr. Borwinkle just reported on his statewide prevalence study, which showed about 30% of, of the region have, have already been infected. So that's 2.1 million people. Now, you know, you figure at least one shot, I just mentioned 1.8 million, that's up to 3.9 million. Now there is overlap. There are gonna be people who got COVID and also vaccinated. So it's not, you know, 100% right, but that's, you know, 3.9 million about who will be resistant either because they had it or because they got vaccinated. That means we got a million to go, just a million people to go. 
But most kids have not been vaccinated. So there's a huge opportunity. And Houston's a younger city than most cities. So 25% of our 7 million population, or 1.75 million, are kids. If we can get 60% of them vaccinated, that's another potential million people vaccinated. So I think by mid to late August, we will hit 70%. You know, I think that's really great. But just remember, when we hit that 70% rate, there's still 2 million susceptible people. So it's not going to be magically, we all go home, throw our masks off, we're done. There'll be 2 million people in our community that can still get sick from this disease and will get sick. And if you think about it, you know, and you start going, what's the prevalence of that, the number of people who might get infected, you know, there could be close to another 4,000 deaths from COVID by the end of the summer. If we got everybody vaccinated more quickly, we could, we could mitigate that tremendously. I wish, I wish we could. And if you look where vaccine hesitancy is the most prevalent, the dark blue is bad for, for vaccine hesitancy. It's in the states that have the worst cases and are most re resistant to wearing masks, like the upper Midwest, some parts of the deep south. You know, you go like, wait a minute, you know, everyone's dying, everybody's sick, everybody's dying, you're not wearing masks and you don't want to get vaccinated. It's like, okay, you remember that Neanderthal response I was talking about? So you ask people, why, why, why are people hesitant? So there was a, a great study uh, from the census, actually, from the U.S. Uh, uh, Census Bureau that asked people, why, the, you know, why are you hesitant? If, you're, if you are hesitant, why? So here's the reasons. 50% were concerned about, now this is, by the way, there could be many reasons, but these are the number that responded, who were the people who said, I'm hesitant. 50% said they were concerned about side effects. Okay, I understand that. 48% said they don't trust COVID vaccines. What? <laughs> you don't trust them. I mean, your kids have probably gotten MMR, you know, polio, uh, hepatitis. You, you get, but the COVID, that, that's the one I don't trust. You get, everybody else has gotten vaccines, but that one I don't trust. 35% don't trust the government. I'm going like, well, what's the government got to do with... The, it was industry. It was scientists and industry that developed the vaccine. The government's only thing they've done is buy the, day, buy the vaccines to help distribute them. 34% uh, don't believe they need it. I mean, with the number of people dead, half a million people dead in the United States, I don't know. 30% plan to wait and see if it's safe. They've given 280, almost 300 million doses worldwide without a single side effect, without a single death from the, from the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, but you know. See if it's safe. Then it gets less and less and less. Surprisingly, uh, it's, you know, no, th almost nobody, uh, you know, is thinking that the doctor hasn't recommended it. Luckily, the doctors are mostly recommending it. Some people just don't like vaccines. But by and large, the reasons are, you know, to me, uh, kind of lame. But if you look at hesitancy, it is beginning to fall. So this is, a, this is vaccine hesitancy is also beginning to fall. So that's really, really good. I wanted to do one scientific shout out uh, this week because this is really a dramatic uh, uh, a publication in Nature this week from Bart Haynes uh, and his Vaccine Institute uh, at Duke. This, they, they have been screening lots of different people who have been infected with COVID-19. And what they do is they look at the antibodies generated and then they test that antibody against a, cro a large number of coronaviruses. And most, most of the people they test, you know, are just, they have an antibody just to the COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. They found a person who was, had an antibody that was broadly neutralizing to many coronaviruses. So what they did then was they mapped out the domain that that particular antibody was recognizing. And it was in the receptor binding domain, but it was a very, very narrow area. They combined that with a toll-like receptor molecule uh, which is a, a natural form of, of something that's very important for natural immunity, and then aluminum, uh, just another typical adjuvant, and gave that as a vaccine to uh, primates. And the primates developed broad neutralization against a, a lot of bat uh, coronaviruses. We talked about the harboring of bat coronaviruses, SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, the UK variant, the South African variant, as well as the Brazilian variant. So this vaccine is really amazing. And, and you know, it's very common that the first vaccines aren't always the best one. Now this will take development. This probably won't develop for you know, a year or so, 
in safety and you know have to go through all the things but it's really really promising it's, it it looks like uh, through this kind of strategy, we might be able to get a vaccine that is broadly protective against many, many coronaviruses. So really exciting, huge development that comes out in Nature this, this that just came out in Nature this week. So I want to end on a, a couple of things. The first thing is, you know, all those people who participate in clinical trials, we owe them a huge comment of thanks. We, we owe them a lot of thanks. I mean, if you think of all those people who said they're reluctant, they're worried about safety, these people are going and enrolling in clinical trials so you and I can be safe. You know, we should just thank those people. And then our faculty member, I was very proud of this, uh, Dr. Uh, Tao Galvan uh, was the first person uh, who volunteered her child who's 16 months old in the under two year old uh, uh, trial with, uh, with Pfizer. That is great. You know, I'm very proud that our faculty members, kids, were the first to be enrolled. And, and, you know, again, you know, think about how brave that is. You're making sure that it's safe for everybody else. So thank, uh, thank goodness for you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Galvin, and, and thanks for doing what you do for the rest of the country. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Lily has been asking me, what is with this vaccine hesitancy? I mean, you know, she's been waiting patiently while, you know, all the other groups get finally, you know, availability. And then suddenly it's open to everyone. And she's sitting there going like, well, well what about dogs? What, you know, what about dogs? And so I said, don't worry, it will eventually open up. So she's pretty excited that it looks like it may open up for everyone. And she thinks that's, that's uh, her. So she's excited about that. She did tell me that, because we live in an apartment building with many other dogs, that apparently there is rampant vaccine hesitancy among Scotties in particular. They are apparently they don't believe anything. They all, they're conspiracy theory, theorists. Uh, and chihuahuas are also not very good. So, but she's all excited, so hopefully she will get her vaccine. We're excited, and she's doing her part. So, great to see everybody. Can't wait to see you next week. Bye-bye. Talking about getting back to a 60% to 70% vaccination status. We need to get to 60 to 70% vaccine rate in the United States. So. Let's all push together and try and make it happen. Uh, we're, all in it we're all in it together, whether we want to be or not, we are all in the same boat.